to do. I'd like you to authorize the recording so you can be part of this and welcome everybody for our second session of four in which through the auspices of Charchemaim in Montreal, uh, we have chosen or they have chosen rather uh, to uh, join me on a journey that I have offered relatively recently, I would say about less than a year ago in a series of lectures that uh, about Israeli poetry that I've been giving a online since the beginning of COVID and there are quite a few people here who participate in that and they know yeah like for example Gloria a and so on and so the other people may know me from Montreal from earlier years but that's another story but anyway so after three and more years of having studied together and we went through all the great ones your Bialiks and Altamans and Leah Goldberg and Rachel and Dalia Rabikovich and Mizrahi poetry and this poetry and that poetry, I decided, I'm going to say about a year ago, I hope I'm not wrong, uh, to invite my participant to join me in listening to voices of a uh, Israeli society, poetic voices that we rarely venture into. So oftentimes even people who visit Israel very often or feel that they are knowledgeable about Israel, if they were extremely honest, and I hope our people here in this class are, you will tell me that your visit in Israel is somewhere between, I would say, the German colony in Jerusalem and Ra'anana <laughs> and maybe a little bit more but how often do you have a chance not just to buy a hummus a pita in an Arab town? How often do you have a chance to really have a conversation with Haredi people eh, and so on and so forth? So this is the opportunity. Last week, we went to read some very contemporary, not so easy, poetic voices of the Arab community in Israel. And I know it was tough for some of the people who participated. Well, today will be very different, probably not as tough, but I hope sort of eye-opening. So if you have not listened to the first one, a Rabbi Mark Fishman can tell you that it's on the Shar YouTube channel and you can easily find it and text the source sheets that I'm using in my session are always accessible and available. Also, if you want to contact me, because if you happen to be involved in some sort of teaching and using this poetry in your sessions, please don't hesitate. Email me at korazim at gmail.com, just my last name as it is under my face on the screen, korazim at gmail.com. You can email me and Mark will tell you and other people here is Edna joining a uh, other people that I do respond to emails. Sometimes it may take it may take me a day or so if I happen to be busy, but I do respond to emails. Okay, so without further ado, let us start today's session, which is taking us into the heart of Haredi society in Israel. So just to make things clear, you know, I never like in my classes to take anything for granted. So what exactly do we mean when we say Haredi? Does everybody who wear a kippah is a Haredi? No. Is every woman who covers her head? No. However, it's very, very difficult to mark exactly the borderline, but I will try. So a uh, Haredi is what one will you would call uh, in English ultra-Orthodox or even ultra-ultra-Orthodox in some cases. And then the Haredi society is not monolithic between a, a, among the ultra-Orthodox or the ultra-ultra-Orthodox, you can find Hasidic groups, you can find non-Hasidic, Mithnagdin, Litvak type of groups, you can find Mizrahi Haredi, okay, people, um, Jewish people, citizens of the state of Israel who originate from Arab countries, this is what you use the term Mizrahi for, and they are in a Haredi society. So one of the things for me to even realize about a year ago when I started uh, doing this, preparing, finding people, uh, trying to read is how on one hand it was 
hard to find modern contemporary Haredi voices because oftentimes, you know, when we talk about Haredim, the last thing on our mind is whether they write poetry or not. We quarrel with them about proper behavior at the war. We quarrel with them about yes or no serving in the military. We quarrel with them about equality for women. I mean, we have so many issues with them. And do we really bother to find out and to figure out whether they write poetry, whether they read poetry and contemporary ones? So this is the purpose of the exercise for today. Much to my, what shall I say it, not shame, but learning experience. When I started doing this, I found out three points that I want to share with you as we dwell in and look at the list. A, Rachel Korazim, you think you are very innovated, innovative, think again. There always was Haredi poetry. So sort of teach myself a lesson and you as well. I started my list with Zelda and Yosef Tzvi Rimon, both of them Zichrona Alvircha, both of them long gone, and they have been there in the early years of pre-state for the case of Yosef Tzvi Rimon, and up till the 80s in the case of Zelda, and so a they have always been here. Why is it that we tell ourselves it's such an innovation to have young Haredi poets? No, they are standing on the shoulders of earlier courageous people within the Haredi community who put their feelings and metaphors and imaginations into amazing poetry. So I gave you in the sheets, uh, in the source sheets, two of them. I think we will only do Zelda together and have a glimpse at the How Shall I Sing by Yosef Tzvi Rimon, just a glimpse, not the whole poem. It's a very long one. You can read it on your own, but I will try to sort of shine light on a certain aspect of it. And then the five below are a much shorter poems, very contemporary. If we said Zichronam Livracha about the first two, Zelda and Yosef Tzvi Rimon, then we should say Yibadlu Lechayim Arukim, may they live long lives a, about all the others. Eli Stern, Shulamit Orbach, Eden Abitbul, Tzvi Winter, and Giti Fine. A, those who are really caught by this poetry, I want to tell you that especially Giti Fine, uh, when I did uh, the session about Haredi women poetry in my uh, Thursday classes, uh, we have a whole session dedicated to the poetry of Giti Fine, who comes from an ultra-Orthodox town, a uh, Bitar elite, and she lives in a Hasidic community. She has eight kids, seven boys and a girl smack in the middle. And she is a psychologist and an amazing poet. So I can send you, if you are interested, if they are interested people, I will send you through Mark the link to a special session with Giti Fine and others. So all these five people are with us creating right as we talk while they lead their yeshiva life or ultra-orthodox Haredi women life in those circles. But I told you about three insights. So the first one is they have always been here. Nothing new about that. There was always poetry in the Haredi community. Second, nowadays it was much easier to get to the guy's poetry online, to find it published, to buy it online, to get to the people. It took me a while until they had time uh, to speak to me after the long study days at the Kollel, because all these Haredi guys are active members of Kollels. It was much more difficult to get to the ladies, to Shulamit Orbach, to Giti Fine. So, uh, but I did. I did through connections and whatever. 
so uh, if you are ready let me just check before i get into the poetry to see if there are any questions as we go into that but a quick question you know just information something that i'm taking for granted and you are not clear about let me know right now and in general you can stop me at any time i have a quick question i'm just why would they have you call them courageous why would a Haredi person have to be courageous to write poetry? I will let one of the poets answer that. Okay. Actually, I will let two of the poets answer that. Okay? A guy and a lady. We will find that in the poetry much better than me trying to explain. We will hear the true, the true authentic voice and then you will be able to judge for yourself. But thank you for the question. Very important. Uh, anybody else? Yala, let's go. So, so as I said, they have always been here. So the first one we are starting with is Zelda. Oi, how I could dedicate, of course, the whole session to Zelda. And there will be no problem whatsoever. So you can see the years, born in the year where World War I started have lived, uh, arrives to Israel when she is a young teacher with her widowed mother, uh, lives uh, all her life since she arrived uh, till the year 1984 uh, in Israel, first in the Haifa area and then in Jerusalem. She started publishing when she was well over 50 and it's a whole story. And Zelda is the poet that was fortunate enough as far as English speakers go to find an American Jewish woman poet in her own right, Marsha Falk, who came and passed some time with Zelda back in the day when Zelda was still alive and Marsha was a bit younger and gave us this beautiful, spectacular difference poetry by Zelda. In my recorded classes about, it, two classes about Zelda's poetry, Marsha Falk participated. She's the one who read to us her translations and it's a very unique experience. So I can give you the links to that as well. Look at the title on the right hand side, bottom of my uh, slide. I know it's in Hebrew, but I will read it together with you. It says Isha Pshuta Zelda, a simple woman, Zelda. Why am I drawing your attention to that particular graphic? It's because it comes from a movie that you can find online and go like, you know, pay-per-view, which is not very expensive. And I highly, highly recommend it. And you can see that on the left-hand side bottom, I took out, you know, just a clip out of that movie and we may be able to to listen to a few minutes of Zelda speaking to us about her poetry. And in our conversation and an insight I got from Marsha Falk and then you will get from the movie as well that the Zelda poetry is a combination of religiosity with total inner freedom. So this is also something on the way of answering your question, Margot whether there is a freedom to say what you want about feelings, about body, about emotions, about sex, erotics, your body, passions, angers, hesitations, doubts in your faith. Can you express all that? And Marsha, in her amazing insights into Zelda's poetry, spoke to us about this combination of religiosity with total inner freedom. So as we go to the first poem by Zelda, let me tell you one very important biographic fact about, Elsa, eh, about Zelda that never should be neglected. She was the first cousin of the Lubavitcher, okay? And they grew up as children together back in the day. And then he went to America and she went to the land of Israel. And they kept us up, Schneelson. Zelda, actually, her last name is Schneelson. 
just like the Lubavitcher, and an ongoing a live conversation between the two of them. And if you believe that conversation, then the Lubavitcher Rebbe Schneel, son of blessed memory, had read Zel some of Zelda's poems. Okay, so we are entering a very unique combination here into the world of ultra orthodoxy. And let us start by reading the poem. So we are listening to a very intimate voice, also to be known about Zelda, that she actually wanted to be an artist. And unfortunately, when they came on Aliyah to Israel when she was a teenager, their economical situation was such that her mother could not afford to send her to art school. So she becomes a teacher. And this is how they make some living for the two women. But later in life, when she could afford, she never went to school, but she started painting. And when you buy a Zelda poetry book in Israel, in Hebrew, they always, always come with beautiful Zelda paintings. So it is my custom when I teach Zelda to put a one or more of her paintings and drawings as an illustration, not necessarily connected to the uh, subject of the poem. And as it is my custom, I will always start by reading a little bit of the Ivrit and then going to the English. And let me check since we are a small group and I will do that very quickly. Is there anybody among you, ladies and gentlemen, who would enjoy reading poetry aloud in English? And I can call upon you to do the English so you get it with a decent Canadian or American accent and not my Israeli one. Anybody who would enjoy reading the poetry in English, let me know, show me a hand. Nobody? Thank you, Esther. So we'll take Esther and Gloria today. And if you come back next week, I'll be asking for some more readers. So it will be for the English and you know, ladies, that you will need to unmute for that. I don't need to remind you. OK, I'm doing I'm starting with doing the Ivrit. And immediately after that, I will ask you, Esther, to go first. OK, so. I just want to say there's a machine here and sometimes I have to turn it off because it makes noise and they're, they're doing construction. Let's hope that it doesn't today okay. while you are reading. If it does, we'll switch to Gloria. Okay. okay. Thank you. So let me do the Ivrit a little bit. Hachol hadak hachol hanura. Im nafshi el tzida tishkav, chafora betoch tsaar venirtat mi alimut, sheba anashim ba mechonot u vanchashim, ולא תשוט בחוץ בסתר הלילה, ולא תעוף עם רוח דרך אלים, קרואה מטקסי חג, בלי שביל אל כל חי, אם נפשי על צידה תשכב, ולא תשמע כל חם את שמע לוחש. That will do for the Hebrew. Let's go for the English, go all the way to the end. Okay. If my soul lies down on its side, dug deep into sorrow, recoiling from violence in people snakes machines, and does not sail in the secret of the night, and does not fly through the leaves with the wind, and is torn from ritual celebrations without a path to the living voice. If my soul lies down on its side and does not hear a warm voice whispering its name, it will forget the mercy of the sun and the walls of the mountain and that hidden spring whose name is a conversation, a spring that once shone the dark. If my soul lies down on its side, wrapped in webs, divorced from deed, expelled from the day to day, a fine sand will come from the shore of the sea and cover it in cover its Sabbath, it's Sabbath. and block to the root its meditations. The fine, terrible sun will pierce the mystery of its weeping before the veiled, hidden God, if my soul lies down on its side, dug in deep sorrow. Thank you so much, Esther, for a lovely reading. And let me call upon you to a close for a closer look. And what we need to be tuned to, that the poem starts with that extremely important conditional word, if. 
and then every single verse starts with if. So you will have to, as you listen to decide whether indeed this is a condition or whether there is a battle here with the soul that is already lying on its side with this sense you know of curling up like when do we lie on our side and curl up like a fetus shape when we are sad maybe even depressed so this is a conversation or telling us sharing a situation where there is an attraction a tendency to do curl up, to do immerse yourself in that sadness, in that loneliness, in not reaching out. And the whole poem is about telling yourself why you shouldn't. And one may ask, is she doing that after a situation of a deep depression? Is this preventive? Is this sort of doing therapy for herself this is a woman who starts writing way before it was very common to go to therapy even in non-orthodox circles let alone maybe she needed and couldn't so listen to that as a conversation with the soul sharing that experience maybe with somebody else who tends to be depressed if my soul lies down on its side, dug deep into sorrow, recoiling from, and now comes the list of things that when you are depressed, you want to save yourself from. Violence in people, snakes, machines. Just look at these three groups, what the depressed person wants to defend themselves and coil on the side and not, not let go. These are the three elements, violent people, snakes, metaphorical, machines out there on the street, cars, machines that you do not know how to operate, big noises, who knows what scares her. When people are on the verge of depression, anything looks like a snake. Even not so violent people may look violent. And machines, just look at that metaphor. It's something that is not human. It's mechanical. It's big, I'm afraid. So if my soul lies down on its side, dug into sorrow, recoiling from violence in people, snakes, machines. Mm -hmm. And now what is that soul doing by coiling on the side? And does not sail in the secret of the night and does not fly through the leaves with the wind and is torn from ritual celebration without a path to the living voice. Zelda, she is saying, if you protect yourself from the violence of people, from your metaphorical snakes, from the machines, you know what will happen. You will never go out and listen to the night. You will never let yourself fly through the leaves with the wind. And, be, and you will be torn from ritual celebration. What do you want to say? You're afraid to go to shul? You don't want to participate? This is what will happen, Zelda, if you recoil on your side and you will not have in your life a path to the living voice. Is it the voice of God? Is it prayer? Is it other people? But beware, person who wants to give in to depression. You may protect yourself from the machines, from the snakes, but by doing that, you are eliminating from your life nature, leaves, the night, celebrations, community, voices. Uh, Becky, you will need to mute yourself, please. Okay. If my soul lies on its side and does not hear a warm voice whispering its name, it will forget the mercy of the sun and the walls of the mountains and that hidden spring whose name is conversation, a spring that once shone in the dark. If you coil and lie on your side, there is a voice out there 
that is whispering, that is reaching out to you. There is the whole of nature. You have to be aware. Don't let go. Don't sink into that depression. If my soul lies down on its side, wrapped in its webs, divorced from deed, expelled from day to day, then if you let that happen to you, wrap yourself in, a we in webs, divorce yourself from doing stuff. You know how oftentimes people when depressed can be paralyzed and do nothing. Expelled from the day to day, it's like exile. It's like expulsion. Listen up. Then there'll be a punishment if you let that happen to you. The fine sand will come from the shore of the sea and cover its Sabbath. So for an ultra-Orthodox woman, Shabbat is the blessing of community, of prayer, of connection, of fire, of light. If you just lie on your side and coil into depression, Sabbath will be taken away from you. It will cover that horrible sand, the terrible sand. This is, by the way, the fine sand, the terrible sand. This will happen to you. It will cover your Shabbat and block to the roots its meditations. The fine, terrible sand will pierce the mystery of the weeping before the veiled hidden God. My, if my soul lies down on its side, dug deep in sorrow so here is maybe for many of you a first encounter with an amazing poet to me a woman marco are you starting to see the courage for an orthodox woman to discuss the tendency for depression for loneliness for not being part of the community and that's not the whole answer. I'll give you more to that question. Gloria, your hand is raised. Is that still from the, re uh, the reading? Okay, anybody would like to make a comment if there is something in this poem that speaks to you? Yes, you, you are ready, so okay. go ahead. <clears throat> um, it, it's such a beautiful poem and it's so poignant. And um, just as a preface, I worked for 45 years in psychiatry as an occupational therapist. And I know that by doing is, is the ability to change, to change yeah. your situation. And, and this poem is so particularly touching for me, but I think she is writing a prescription to not capitulate to, to your vulnerabilities. If you stay connected, you have a chance of at least engaging and seeing another perspective. If you're if you're huddled in your own misery, you you don't see a way out. The very fine different. sand will cover you. Which yeah. is but the other thing I would say, yeah. But I will say, I, being the eternal optimist that I am, that when you are lying in that fetal position, only half of you is is covered and there, there is still a half that is accessible that's on okay. the other side mm -hmm. okay thank you so much my question to you is would you expect for a prescription and a voice like this come to you from an ultra orthodox woman and some practically 50 years ago would that be the perception of us people who do not belong to the ultra orthodox for an ultra orthodox woman to have these insights to write this prescription to say it aloud don't let go don't let yourself get into that if anybody would like to to address that if not we will yes go ahead esther please i think that i was going to say something else before that but which is not the answer to this question but on this question I have met many Orthodox women over my lifetime. And um, yes, there's very intelligent, very um, strong, inner strong. Uh, e even though you can be strong, you can have this kind of depression once in a while. And, but they kind of just chugged on and were able to become 
teachers, and I'm not talking about young ones who are now in their 30s or 40s. I'm talking about people who are now retired. Zelda is gone for 40 years, you know. I know. So I'm talking about people who may have been her age, who I saw when I was younger and spoke to. Um, and there's always somebody somewhere that's going to have that strength and, and, and speak out in spite of whatever they're living through. Exactly. Thank you so much for that, Esther. And let's try and do another poll. Yes, please, Gary, go ahead. Please unmute. My my Zeta was an Orthodox rabbi. And if you ever if you ever met my Baba, you would know not to take her for granted in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. She you, was Baba. sharp, she was challenging, she was all the right things. Mm -hmm. But being able to, to talk freely in her community about depression? Absolutely. Talk about anything to anyone at any time. Thank you. Okay, Connie, please. Yeah, so I'm very moved by it. And I, I, I see this poetry is quite atypical. I mean, that's what I would have assumed, that it would be very rare. And it really makes me think of Kolisha. Mm -hmm. um, and in the ultra orthodox community, where Kolisha, the woman, is given no, is not a loud voice, even if we usually associate that with the music, uh, poetry is like music. And so I'm extremely moved by the, it is a kind of audacity of mm -hmm. um, having her voice be heard um, and talking about the agency of the woman. It's not about how God will bring you out of your depression or anything else. It's really about the person doing it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Beautifully written. So I, I, I'm very moved by that. It's not what I would have expected. So thank you. Thank you for your honesty, uh, because this is exactly why we are doing this type of session. And uh, let me tell you that uh, if, if you love Zelda's poetry, look up Marsha Falk's translation. It's, it's accessible, you know, online. And uh, I would like now to continue. So the story with our second poet tonight uh, is, as I said, a little bit more complicated. He is a man, Hasid, who, who made Aliyah and then uh, you can see the years he has been gone for almost 70 years now. And the poem is called How Shall I Sing Eicha Ashir? And if you are sensitive to the Hebrew, then you will know that the word Eicha is like Megillat Eicha, the scroll of Eicha that we read on Tisha B'Av. So the title itself of the poem suggests a sense of mourning, a sense of loss. And, and indeed, uh, this person, Yosef Sri Rimon, uh, was attacked by, by Arabs early after his aliyah and wounded and mutilated in a way to, to harm his manhood. And in ultra-Orthodox circles, men like that cannot really belong to the public, so he secluded himself because of that and poetry was his voice. So I highly recommend to look up his poetry it is available online, even in translation. And I want uh, to take from his words, just this verse. How shall I sing about day and night when it was God who created them? How shall I sing about heaven and earth when it was God who established them? How shall I sing about mountains and hills when it was God who shaped them? How shall I sing about seas and deserts when it was God who produced them? How shall I sing about the world in its fullness when it was God who, who ordered it? I will sing the Creator exalted above all. To God alone will I sing. So this is the vo a voice that you can hear in Haredi poetry often enough. Who am I at all to express myself about the world when it was created by God Almighty? And there is inner self-doubt whether a human has the right at all to express their opinion, their feelings 
about the deeds of God. And the result here or the solution, if you wish, to the dilemma, uh, dilemma is I will not sing about what you have done, God. I will sing about you. Okay. And all my poetry uh, will go that way. So we are looking at the ending of this poem. I want nothing but you, oh my God. What are suns or stars to me? What is anything without you? I am an Ivri, a Hebrew. My soul asks only for truth. With my whole heart, I sought you and you were revealed to me. You lifted the cover from my eyes and I see you in everything and you are in my heart. The picture that I gave you is actually of a street, a boulevard in Tel Aviv named after him. So it's called Shderot Yotzer, and Yotzer is short for Yosef Tzvi Rimon. So Shderot Yotzer is the street named after him in Tel Aviv, a not very well-known personality, but in some circles he left a mark of one earlier than Zelda even, of modern poetry written in Hasidic circles, and now I will skip this one because I want to come to the answer to your question, Margot. And the uh, I want you to look at the pictures of the woman on the right. It's very clear she is not a Haredi woman, right? I don't need to tell you that. And you don't need for me to tell you that. So this is Noam Partum. And Noam Partum as a the the footmark at the end of the next a the next a slide will tell you she is an explicit Israeli performance artist and a poet. So a non partum is very alive in the spoken word poetry poetry slams in Tel Aviv. Very provocative. Look at her body. Look at the way she dresses, or rather less than dresses. And you know the the makeup and the gestures, everything. And here is our poet, Shulamit Orbach, you'll see a picture in the next slide, who lives in Bnei Brak, a ultra, ultra Orthodox town next to Tel Aviv. And it's in Bnei Brak that she can, as she wants to write her poetry. I want to say a word about the three translators here because obviously Shulamit Orbach is not Zelda and she is not a Yuda Amichai, so you don't have ready-made translations into English, but in our group of poetry that meets online since the beginning of Corona, we have these two volunteers, a, one from Boston, one from Palo Alto, Michael Bonin and Heather Silverman, who help me with the translation. So I do a rough translation and then they make proper English out of it. And a, I have, of course, I think I have the Hebrew, do I? No, I do not. I wanted to save time. So uh, you saw the pictures and let me now see, uh, show you Noam Partom, uh, not Noam Partom, Shulamit Orbach, as she is about to read her poetry in a library, not in a poetry slam type of, you know, bar or something like that. Very different. But I want you to be aware of the fact that she is aware of the fact of Noam Partom. So with all her secluded life and many children, and a, you know, it's not her natural hair, of course, it's a wig. And I met Shulamit Orbach just about two months ago, a story that I will not spend time on sharing right now, but she is a lovely person. And hers is the group that you needed permission to access online. The guys group was easier to access. This one, I needed protexia. I needed to go through somebody who knew me and knew her and persuaded her to let me join the group and read the poetry of herself and the other woman. So, okay. In Bnei Brak, this ultra-Orthodox town, you cannot be Noam Parton. Do you understand that? People who don't understand why courage is needed, because Noam Partom and the likes of her, they live in other places. And I live in Bnei Brak. I cannot be like her, although I'm aware of her, although we belong to the same generation, 
although we are of the same age, although we both are women, it's impossible to be Noam Partom in Bnei Brak. You have to accept this. True. You want so much to be fighting poet, courageous, but do not forget you are also part of a group and you are not interested in crossing the line. So please, you can be smart, special, sharp, to the point, cynical, even cutting into living flesh, but everything in moderation. Every word considered, weighed, let there be no confusion, do not cross the border. Well, theoretically you could, but there will be a few unavoidable consequences, but you don't really want to, so you do not cross. You yearn to be different and to continue to belong at the same time. You want to be different and to continue to belong, to break through but remain, to dare but not to hit, to be hit by ricochets at home. This has been your conflict from as long as you remember. Even when you were a little girl, you knew you were different. The words gushed out before you noticed or understood. You need to know how to stop, to check if there is a curve before you gallop ahead. You will learn to keep quiet just as you know how to speak. You cannot be Noam Partom in Bnei Brak. Got it? You must internalize it. It's simple after you understand. As a matter of fact, she too is struggling with the poison of criticism and hatred, both internal and external. Who are you to speak? A rookie? A Haredi woman who has not even started to run? You are going to learn to keep many words in your belly, to sift with 17 sieves what you will print and to pray that the product is acceptable, that you created so independent. What can be done? You are different. Yes, it matters where you live and what you wear and eat and observe. Now that you know that's important, try to be a poet. So I'd like to leave this hanging in the air for a minute and read to you another one called When They Ask You by Eden Abitbul. And I met Eden as well. It's a short one. I want to do a, first of all, a, the publishing house, Pargod Tanjir is a sort of independent, not one of the large publishing houses. And it does a, publish a lot of the poetry that we are reading in these series. And I want to do the reading of both, but I need you for to use your imagination. When a child in Haredi world wants to be accepted to one of the good yeshiva, Ktana, the small one, and later the bigger ones. The family background is very important. In what kollel is your father studying? What yeshiva did he graduate from? Where is he planning to be a rabbi? You know, that kind of thing. And the expectation from men in some of these circles is to do nothing but study Torah. So here is a conversation or rather a monologue of a father who likes to do other stuff, giving his son instructions. כשישאל <laughs> When they ask you, 
when they ask you what your dad does, don't tell them. Say that dad learns Torah. I sit long hours in front of the lined pages of Gemara so that you can answer the question with confidence so no lie is detectable. detectable. And if you detect a suspecting smile, shoot in all directions. Dad is a poet. Dad writes movie scripts. Dad is awake at night. Dad roars in the woods. But I, I learned Torah. So what I'd like to do is to take these two poems, one by Shulamit Orvach and the other by Noam Eden, a young man and young woman, parents within Haredi circles who write and publish their poetry. And both of them tell us why do you need so much courage? And if you have any conversation with that, anything that you'd like to share, about any of these two and the insight they give us into their world. Questions are fine as well. I'll give it a minute or so to see if anybody would like to share in the conversation. I'm interested that you put the two of them together because first of all, I think they're so deep, each one of them. It could have been that we could have studied each one separately. Sure. Um, I don't know if connection. it's harder to take them together. Yeah. So take one. Which one? I'll take the first. I'll take the first one. It it makes Shall me. Shall I put deeply... it on the screen for you? Sure, please. The first one, please. Uh -huh. oh, it yeah. makes me deeply sad that. For, for Shulamit. Yeah. Oh, okay. that, um, there is this sense of wanting to be her true self and is not able to and although she admits she also wants to be part of her community it almost sounds as if it is a pragmatic wanting to be a part of her community for fear of reprisals or exclusion but deep down she wants to be someone else can you describe for our audience what some of these reactions and reprisals may be for a woman like that if she went beyond the line? You may happen to know. Um, <laughs> I, I think you're assuming a little, but I will try. Um, I think within a Haredi ultra-Orthodox community, well, the first distinction is, are you married or not married? She, I think, is. is. But if, if you're young and not married, the first reprisal is that you are stigmatized and you sure, sure, do sure. not then have a marriage opportunity because of the arranged marriage reality in that community. Not only, it, it sounds exaggerated, I don't believe it is, not only would you then not have a marriage partner opportunity, but there is a possibility that the rest of the family could then become tinted True. by virtue of your behavior and as such the whole family then is uh off limits okay so let me now make the connection to the other poem okay, okay with the kid this is one of the reprisals your kids will not be accepted to the proper yeshiva that you want to send them to and here is this father studying for hours just so that his son will not have to lie when asked what is your father doing okay so you can see some connection between these right. two and then, uh, yeah yeah anybody else that, on that, that kind of that kind of question doesn't even have to be ultra orthodox i remember when i was bringing my daughter to an interview for high school and we walked in and we saw a friend of mine with a wig and she went like this to me, don't say anything. And I wasn't gonna say anything. And then afterwards she said to me, if I don't wear a wig, she won't be accepted into the school. And I said to her, but you're lying. And she said, but that's not important. The important thing is that she can get the education that I want her to get. And I walked out of there and I said, I don't want my daughter to go to a school like that. Hmm. 
even if it's the best education in the world, I don't want that. I want her to be able to be herself within a religious world. I understand that, but I don't want her to have to lie, you know, and, 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 and to be, and when, when you're asked, you have a television at home to say no, when you know you do, I don't want that. To me, that's not religion. To me, that's not Judaism. To me, that's not being a moral person. And I think that's very important. And I think with these two poems, this child will never be accepted because people will know what his father does. And it's not only him. It's also, if he ever gets married, it's a question of shidduch. You know, mm. your children will not, be, it will not be accepted into the shidduch world and their shidduch will, 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 will suffer, which so has nothing to do with you. What happened when a... You know, in my classes that were created during COVID, I oftentimes had musicians invited to join, and I tried to match the musicians to the content. And there was a guy who was helping me with that and finding the, the musicians, and he got an ultra-Orthodox musician who also creates his own music. And I send the musicians the poems that we are reading in class ahead of time so they can match what they play. And this guy actually composed music to this poem. And when he performed, this is COVID days from home, he had one of his sons standing by him as he was singing, because he said to us, this is me. Eden is writing about me. I don't know what to say to my children, how to tell them not to be ashamed of their father who is a musician. So it's very, very true that these things are happening. Uh, let me bring us back to one poem that I don't want to miss for today, actually tonight at my end, because I love so much uh, the work of Giti. And uh, they are actually, believe it or not, two poems, one by Tzvi Winter and the other by Giti Fine. And they are both about the experience of a potential ultrasound screening. And since we, let's read both of them, okay? So uh, let's write with Tzvi. This is the guy escorting his wife to the ultrasound. And then we will hear the woman being escorted by her husband to the ultrasound performed by a guy, okay? So, uh, Gloria, will you do the English this time uh, for me? Just remember to unmute yourself. And uh, I am reading uh, the Hebrew or a little bit of Tzvi Winter. Ultrasound. Ani pogesh otcha b'boker ayef mi bad l'tzag masach b'shachol l'van. Chilkei evarim b'godel matim l'shavua en malidog. אתה עדיין קודמש שנברא ונוח לך מרחף מעל מים בתוהו ובוהו שלך ואור וחושך? הוא יכול להבחין כבר בצלליות. אני כבר נברא עד כאב, מציץ אליך ורץ לפשפש במעשיי, בונה עולמות ומחריב, מנסה להבדיל לך בין יום ללילה, לארוז עולם בתמונה ומסגרת, לומר בשבילך ויהי אור. בדיבורים שלנו אומרים נעשה אדם, קוראים לך בשמות, כמה נחמות תלויות בהתגבלות עפר שלך. אתה עכשיו למעלה מטעם, למעלה מדעת, ואנחנו מושכים אותך בצירים וחבלים נבקעים בשבילך, בחללי הפחד שלנו חנוקים, רוצים כבר לבכות ביחד בכי ראשון שלך. English, please. Will you do it for us, Gloria? With pleasure. <clears throat> I met you one weary morning through a screen, a black and white display, limb parts appropriate in size for the gestational week. Nothing to worry about. You're still in the period before creation, and you're comfortable hovering over the waters in a formless void, light and darkness, he can already discern shapes. I've already been created in pain, glancing at you and hastening to examine my deeds, building worlds and destroying them, trying to separate day from night for you, to pack a whole world into a picture and frame, to say to you, let there be light. 
We have a saying, let us make man. You have many names. How many consolations depend upon your earthly form? You are now above sensation, above knowledge. We are pulling you with contractions and labor pains being torn apart for you, strangled in our fearful spaces, wishing to cry together your first cry. Thank you, Gloria, for a lovely reading as always. And look at the combination of text and subtext and reference. This is a yeshiva bocha. And his visit to the ultrasound arises the whole image of creation in Genesis and also a, the Midrash, which says that God said creating words and destroyed, destroying them until he created this one. So let's go through the structure, which is beautiful, especially in the beginning. This is the father talking to his son, still there on ultrasound. I met you one weary morning through a screen, a black and white display. Hello, son. We just met. Limb parts appropriate in the sun, uh, in the size for the gestational week. Nothing to worry about. Can you hear the father's voice and the doctor's voice talking to them? Okay. Back to the father talking to his son. You are still in the period before creation and you are comfortable hovering over the water in a form, formless void, light and darkness. This is Genesis. In the beginning, you know, there was Tohu Vavu, etc. And then the doctor is coming back. He can already discern shapes. So there is an inner emotional, spiritual conversation between father and son. And then the practicality is coming from the doctor. I have already been created in pain glancing at you and hastening to examine my deeds. I'm here already, but now that you are coming, I need to check myself. Am I ready for you? And now we come to the Midrash, building worlds and destroying them like God said before the creation, trying to separate day from night for you, my son, to pack the whole world into the picture and frame ultrasound to say to you, let there be light. When you will come, there'll be light for you. We have a saying in our circles, let us make man again, quote, have a nice Adam. You have many names. How many constellations depend on your earthly form? You are now above sensation, above knowledge, and now it's us, we, his mother and the father. We are pulling you with contractions and labor pains, being torn apart for you, strangled in our fearful spaces, wishing to cry together your first cry. And you know exactly what he's talking about, that fear of that moment of birth until the baby cries. And he describes that as a unity of actually God, father, mother, baby, all waiting for that creation through a cry, which is not yet a word. And without further ado, my very favorite Gitti, let's go straight to the English. Okay, Gloria, why don't you do that? Prenatal ultrasound screening. Eighth pregnancy, well done. Lift your shirt, it's only gel. Well done, what can I say? Have you had any surgeries, hospitalizations? Well done. Look, here's the heart, four chambers, nice septa he has in his heart, nice septa. Say it already. I'm keeping quiet and digging at the paper sheet. It's torn. Arabs come here sometimes. They don't wanna know anything but the gender. Husband, do you see the brain? This is an Einstein, this one. Spine, kidneys, bladder. They say it would be a three-dimensional ultrasound. So they said, I am looking in secret for signs of a girl. Some man, this one. I haven't seen anything like it in a while. Some man, look between his legs. My heart is sinking in the women's section behind mechitzas without you. Okay, so Gitti, did I not tell you that Gitti had seven boys and a girl. 
<laughs> and she was so honest in the session. Some of you may remember, maybe Edna, mm -hmm. maybe Gloria, how she said how she was praying. And, you know, the guys always want boys. And she knows her husband wants another boy. And the doctor is so happy to give him those great news. And he's not even an Arab who all they want <laughs> is to hear the, the gender, you know? And she's praying and, and tearing the sheet, the paper sheet, wanting a girl so much. So just like the, the, the guy's poem is to a son, her poem is to a girl that did not materialize that particular time. Okay, anybody wanting to comment about the two ultrasound? Yes, Jen, go ahead. Well, the isolation is stunning too. The, the, the symbolism of a machitza and she has a pizza from the members of her own family yeah. that she couldn't even have a girl to, to ally with behind the mechitza. Yeah. And she's all alone and she's, she feels that, I think, which is probably in, the way it could be. In that examination room, when she's, you know, can you lift your shirt? She's half naked there and still she is behind the mechitza because, you know, the big thing, she wants a girl. Yeah. And the first poem I wanted to comment, if I may, is very, very beautiful. And it feels a little bit like apologizing. We have to take you from this place of total perfection to this place of separation between light and darkness yeah. and pain. And uh, we don't know how to do this. We're crying with you. Yeah, but we are <laughs> waiting for that cry because that will mean life. Oh yeah, we're wait yes, we're waiting for this cry and we don't know what the heck to do when, <laughs> when you come, <laughs> which is also true. Yeah, Bina, you had your hand raised earlier. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm struck by uh, what happens in the uh, English translation of the uh, severe winter, where you don't have the gender pronoun I, right? Because in Hebrew, to me, it's very striking because the Ani, the I, who is meeting for the first time, you know, in that ultrasound on the screen is a man, right? And throughout the poem, you hear Ani Pogesh, uh, uh, and in Ivra, a man speaking. That's it's a man, a man speaking. speaking in in English, unless you kind of register that it's a poem by a man. But of course, it could be a poem by a man about a woman who is meeting, you know, her. Yeah, you are absolutely yeah. right. So that. it was very striking to me, well, you know, like because I I respond very strongly to a man, and especially if it's an ultra orthodox Haredi man, and in that room, you know, with his wife and the ultrasound. Um, yeah. yeah, so. And so if I are, if I may just uh, very may. quickly just say um, on the the two poems you know the uh, Bnei Brak uh, yeah, Shulamit Orbach Bnei Brak, and yeah. uh, the Eden Abed Ball what was very striking to me there is that there was it was all about the community pressure and how this very religious you know person of faith whether a man or a woman uh, is responding to the the community restrictions on them. But there, were, there was nothing about how that affects their relation to the divine. So I thought, to me, these were poems about how those community pressures really interfere with one's own faith in a more profound sense, right? Because it, it, it was all about how those community pressures don't let me be myself. It doesn't, it doesn't say that the God, you know, doesn't let me be myself, but how, in a way, those community pressures seem to interfere with my relation to the divine. I hear you, and I will say the following. I chose those two poems to reflect that voice in the poetry. I chose other poems to show reactions to the divine. In the first two ones, the Zelda and the other one, there is another one in your collection that we haven't read today about running away from God in your poetry and then we had this absolutely compilation of me my wife my baby god and the ultrasound all there together so in in reading haredi poetry you will hear what you are reading and this is just one hour of a very rich and growing poetry nowadays so, uh, Mark, before I let you close this session, let me say the following. I hope you had a taste. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to write to me. Try to make a point and see the Zelda movie. It's really, really worth your while. 
And next week, I think it's our LGBTQ contemporary poetry. And let me already do a spoiler. That class will also start with Hello, Rachel Korazim. There was always LGBT poetry in Israel. Just we needed to look for it. Okay. Margot, was your question answered? I am so happy you asked me. I cannot thank you enough. I really appreciate Bina's comment because it was more aligned with me. I have more trouble than ever. Nothing changed. I still question the word courage. For me, that second poem, oh, that, that, oh boy, that was beautiful. That was my favorite. Mm -hmm. So clearly stated. You said something about him that I wasn't sure I heard. He, he was attacked and he lost his memory. Not memory. Did I hear that? Manhood, his genitals were deformed when he was attacked manhood not so manhood. then okay and then he couldn't be Man part of the community in such a way there is a restriction about what they can and cannot join oh wow a very I tragic was story still... very very tragic story when i think of courage i think of the people that I've heard that have spoken in Montreal who have left the Haredi community with no skills to live in the world. And that's, and that's courage. I'm sorry, but that to me is courage. You know, okay, to, Margaret, I don't. That's fine. But the purpose of the exercise just last last week, we don't need to agree. These sessions are no. just an invitation to listen. But that's what you do so beautifully in what you present, because we get all it, it, Jews don't like to. You, you, you said it's just an invitation to listen, but I say surely it's much more than that. <laughs> OK, thank you, uh, Mark. I will hand it over to you uh, before we close the recording. Thank you, uh, Rachel. This was challenging and fascinating and enlightening. I, I am unable to conclude in a way that would be appropriate because my mind is working overtime right now. It, it takes hours, if not days. I have to tell you, Rachel, I walked with you for three, four days of my life last week. Wow. <laughs> Whether I was in the minion or whether I was out running or whether I was working, all I was thinking about were those Arab poems. And mm -hmm. you stuck with me for three, four days. And I said, how does she do it? She's in my head and she's now like I'm walking through my my journey of life with Rachel in my head. So, so this week you're going with Haredi. Yes. So I, it, <laughs> it, it takes a while. It sinks in. It needs to be uh, digested. That's the word. But this is so rich and challenging and, and wonderful. And I thank simply you. will say thank you. Okay. Come back Friends, we're going to continue Raise next Wednesday, Montreal time at 2 p.m., Israel time at 9 p.m. And uh, if you are enjoying these classes, we have two more Wednesday nights or Wednesday afternoons to go, please mention this to your friends. Um, I am sending out a reminder email every uh, Tuesday now, a day in advance, and then again, a couple of hours before the class begins. And we are accompanying those emails for those who are registered with the texts of the poems also. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed. And Rachel, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chavre. See you next week. Bye. Thank you very much. It's Bye -bye. Thank you very much.